let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is the sound okay? All right. Okay. Um, my name is Volkan. Um, as you might know, I've done the art piece that just went to corner on the concert hall. And um, it's great to be here um, and to kind of also give you a bit of an uh, overview how the art was produced. Um, I was told that it would be quite interesting for you to actually know the kind of um, the methods, um, how to do these things, also the kind of um, the logistics that it takes. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about how we got there from the very beginning and also how we produced it, fabricated it, installed it, um, and try to give you a bit of an insight into the, um, the entire project. Um, I can also show you a few other projects that are going on right now with my company um, that we're doing at the moment um, towards the end. And um, if there are questions, of course, uh, feel free to like you know let me know. This is supposed to be very kind of informal, so if you have any questions, raise your hand, you know, or ask right away, um, and I'm happy to answer any kind of thoughts or ideas that you have uh, as well. Um, okay, so I have to go back and forth a little bit because um, the computer is over here, but um, that's the piece. Um, obviously, it's occupying the south corner of the concert hall. Um, when we started the project, this was the kind of image that was kind of sent to us or given to us. Um, you all know the, pro the, the building itself. It's this um, large concert hall that's kind of uh, made out of these aggregated volumes. And um, when we were asked to come up with an idea to populate the, the wall, which is the large wall there, right next to the, um, underneath, uh, above the loading dock, the first thing that came to my mind was not just put something on the wall like a mural, but have something that's very three dimensional. So something that kind of like extends out of the wall and becomes kind of part of the building. So we did a few tests to just put something on that facade and it just didn't feel right. So we figured we might ask if we can slightly change the location of the art piece. So it's not just on that one wall um, and actually start to rotate it around the corner. And that's actually when we first started to actually like bring it around the corner. Um, kind of starting to occupy the corner, starting to occupy two different facades. Um, at the same time also extended above the building line. And that really started to kind of uh, become quite interesting because it um, became uh, something that's not just attached to the building but something that's part of the building as well. Um, I actually, I do a lot of sketching as an artist when I, when I design things. This project was different. This is something that we did totally in the computer, so it's all digital. Um, which was quite an interesting experiment as well. Um, and what we basically did, we, we were able to write our own algorithms. So we can like um, use certain softwares like Rhino and Grasshopper and they have these kind of fancy names. Um, and reuse our kind of knowledge of how to compute these days uh, to produce these, these pieces. Um, and that's interesting because you're able to very much um, change things as you go on the fly. So if you want to change sizes, dimensions, locations, you can do that by just manipulating a couple of code lines um, and immediately like get an update, right? You know, kind of one-to-one -one update right away. So what we did here is basically we started to project points uh, onto the surface. And those points, I think there's about 300 of those, we started to distribute on the surface until we found a very interesting kind of pattern that we enjoyed. Then each point was given a rectangle uh, that was placed into the center of those points. And then based on the, um, the relationship between those rectangles to each other, distances uh, and so on, the rectangles started to change in size. So you have smaller ones, larger ones and so on. And that's all based on computing. So you can actually write a couple of um, um, sentences in coding and it, it will do that for you. And then you can test it. You can like put more points, less points. You can change the distance between the points and so on. And once we had established that kind of, um, kind of two-dimensional setup, we started to extrude the points um, and basically extrude uh, the components um, into kind of a three-dimensional um, setup. And again, that extrusion has to do with two parameters. One was um, we can only go four feet because if it's more than four feet out of the wall, it, it's too far out, structurally it wouldn't work. So we had this kind of distance between kind of zero and four feet. So within that kind of distance, we started to kind of play with different sizes and length and so on. And again, with the, with the tools that we use, we're able to do it very fast and very quick. Um, not that all of them are successful, but then we start to generate um, 
basically a, a, a variety of options that we then pick and choose and pick the best one that we think works the best. That's a kind of aesthetic quality, uh, formal quality, and so on. So these are some of the screenshots of the kind of scripts we use. Um, and you know, it looks quite complex, but it's actually something that I'm pretty sure every single one of you can do if they're interested in picking it up. Well, if you're interested. <laughs> um, because you know, it's pretty straightforward. These are things that are available to almost everybody. Uh, this is actually software that's free, so it's down, you know, anybody can download it. And if you just spend a bit of time and effort and interest in it, you can do a lot of interesting stuff um, that's quite powerful, actually. Um, and then also, uh, I was explaining yesterday to uh, a few people that we, we looked at uh, the art piece. Um, we also start to shape it. So it's not, just, it's not just putting points and rectangles and changing the size and dimension and extruding them. We also start to shape it. And um, you see there's a, a slight curve on this facade. This is a pure elevation. You see a slight curve on this one. And the same happens on the other side. So if you're actually standing at a certain point on campus or two different points on campus, you can see that exact curve <coughs> happening. And that curve is what I call an attractor curve. So in the computer, we, we can draw curves, and we can th have things attract to it. So it can basically extend to that curve. right? And you can change the curve. You can make it longer, uh, have much longer radius, for instance, or much more extreme radius. And these pieces will adjust. right? So we start, yeah? What, what is the name of the software? It's called Grasshopper. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's a plugin for a software called Rhino, which is Rhinosaurus, uh, which is a modeling software where you can, you know, architects use it quite often, for instance. Um, um, so that helped us kind of shape it, right? It's almost like very much like a sculptor shaping the piece, but just we were able to do it basically with our algorithms uh, in that regard. Um, another aspect that's important with these kind of projects. I mean, that's a, that's a building that's been there for a while, right? So people have built that, architects, engineers have been involved with it. So we can't just show up and say we're going to put something on there. We actually have to start a discussion, a conversation, how to do it. So we got in touch with the engineers of the building called Martin & Martin, who are based in Denver. So you have to find the guy that was actually working on that project um, and start to explain what you're trying to do. Um, they like actually the idea of what we propose, so they're very enthusiastic about you know, helping us figure out how to do this. Um, we had to make sure that whatever we put on the wall is structurally capable to put on there. For instance, you have a lot of wind here, apparently. You have a lot of snow, I heard. Um, so these things are factors that we need to take into consideration. Because um, if you put something out there that can't leave us four feet and snow comes on it, and there's, there's a kind of a wind uh, deflection, you have to make sure that whatever you do is actually like possible. So with the engineering inputs, we actually like produce these kind of like um, diagrams. Uh, we had to understand how it gets connected to a wall. We had to understand what the wall is made of, how much load it can take, and all these things. Um, and that's also fun in a way. So it's not just fun to design it, but it's also actually fun to understand the logistics to actually bring it from uh, a concept stage to a realistic stage. And then what you see there is the Colorado License Engineering staff. Uh, so somebody who's licensed as an engineer in Colorado then stamps it. We send it to the building department. They give us a permit, and then that's basically the, the okay to move forward. A couple of other just um, drawings of the piece from the engineer. They basically start to analyze each single fin for each single extrusion, and make sure that they, uh, all of them actually work because um, there's there, every single fin is kind of different. And also, depending on the, on the height of the building and where they're located, they have different kind of performance that they need to uh, take care of. So these are the kind of drawings you see when you, when you talk to engineers. Um, so as an artist, I try to do images that look nice and that I can show a client um, and so on. So there's kind of visual impact of the images. The engineer doesn't really care. He just cares about getting it done, and so these are the images that the engineer does, and I do a totally different set of images, for instance. Right? So there's different audiences, different constituencies that you work towards. Okay, so um, once it's approved, once a building permit is there, once everyone's happy, also with colors and so on, which I'll discuss in a minute, um, we can actually start fabricating it. Um, 
Meanwhile, we learned, for instance, how thick the material has to be. We learned what kind of material it has to be. You know, is it stainless steel, aluminum? What, what is it, the thickness of it? Uh, we decided to go to aluminum based on a couple of um, um, thoughts. A, it's very lightweight. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have much weight to it. So when you put it on the wall, it actually works very well for you. Um, also, you can, for instance, weld aluminum. Some of these pieces are actually welded. Um, you can powder coat aluminum, um, and it's, it's, it's very easy to handle as well. Um, so we decided to basically use uh, aluminum sheets, um, and one advantage that the software has as well, it can tell us exactly how much material we need. Um, so if I say I want five more of those pixels, it will tell us immediately how many more sheets of material we need. Uh, we cut these pieces out of four by eight feet uh, aluminum sheets. I think it's a three eight of an inch thickness. Um, so you see here um, one of those sheets, and you already see the, the pieces already cut. Um, they're cut either with a water jet cutter or with a laser jet cutter or with a CNC machine. So you can choose and pick which one is the most cost efficient. Um, with this one, we used the water jet because it had. Um, it was the most cost efficient. It didn't because the pieces don't have too much detail. Um, it was actually something that we decided that was the, the most um, efficient way to do this. Okay, so um, I explained earlier during the dedication that um, you know this is something that is not just one person doing it, but it's an entire team. So I have people in my office, in my studio, and there's also this fabrication team based in Denver called Demiurge. Basically, um, I've worked with in the past on two other projects, and they were also kind to also like take this one on and support me basically in building and fabricating and installing it. Um, so this is their shop, and you see here, you know, like some of the pieces already cut. Uh, you see every single piece has a number on it. It's actually just written with a sharpie. Another option would be to engrave the number of each piece on, in it as well which is very, would be much more elegant, but uh, it's a more expensive because you have to run the machine longer, right? And every time the machine runs, it costs money. So doing this with a Sharpie is much cheaper, much more affordable. Um, it gives you also a bit of like um, personality to the piece. Also, you won't see it later because it will be painted anyhow, right? So it doesn't matter. But those are the small decisions you need to make as well when you design something like this because there's over, I think there was at the end, I mean, now it's 500 pieces on the wall, sorry, 300 pieces on the wall, but before we put it all together, there was over 600 pieces that you have to kind of uh, navigate through. So there needs to be a logistic on how to kind of categorize them, where do they go um, on the wall and so on. So numbering system is very important. Um, so here you see some of the kind of extruded pixels, as I call them. Um, they're just flat at the moment. Um, and you see they already have this kind of shape that you see on the, uh, in, on the, on the final piece. Um, but what we need to do, for instance, here with a piece like this, we have to break it. Right? So we have to actually like, put it into a machine that um, takes a flat piece of aluminum and gives it an angle. And I'll show it to you as well. There's a picture here. Um, so this is the, the sheet. You, you take them out and then you start kind of organizing them. Uh, there's lots of them, of course. Um, there's a lot of cleaning as well because you know there's grease to it. It has a certain kind of like film on it that you need to take care of uh, because this is at the end of the day it's art, you know, and we want to make sure that every single piece has the kind of quality uh, that that we want it to be. Also, we need to clean it for like you know for later when we powder coat it, when we paint it, and so on. So we need to get rid of all the grease and all that stuff. So there's a lot of kind of. Um, um, Cleaning involved and making sure that all the kind of um, residue is, is off the surface. At the end. Um, we also have to like clean some of the edges. Like there's holes in every piece. That's where the, the, the bolt goes through, or the screw that holds it to the, towards the wall. Sometimes when the water jet didn't do a very good job, there's a bit of residue, so you actually have to go in and clean it. Um, so even though everything's mechanized, you still have to sometimes go in there and just clean some of the edges to make sure it actually has the kind of perfect um, finish that, that you want. Um, some of the pieces, and then this is the break. Um, you need a strong guy to do it, <laughs> obviously. Um, no, it's actually very simple. It, it's a very easy mechanism. Anybody can do it. 
um, the brake has um, the option to give it different angles. So we have certain angles here for each piece. Um, so you, you arrange the angle, you set it up, you basically just lift it up real fast, and then the piece gets folded. Right? It's almost like a piece of paper that you fold and you decide what the angle is. So there's lots of them that need to be folded. So it's it's kind of a you know a mechanism you see people are doing, people are doing, and then you um, you produce all these kind of folded pieces. Um, next step is um, to kind of place these kind of components together, um, and uh, this is something just welding it. Different ways of welding, uh, make mag, and so on, um, but. Um, here, what's maybe important to see is we had to build a jig, right? Because you have to weld that piece in a certain angle to each other. So we had to fabricate a jig, some sort of scaffold, and you see it on the left side there on the table, that holds the piece in position exactly in the angle that you want it to be. Um, and some angles were different than others, so we had to kind of build several of these jigs uh, and then make sure that um, you, know, you get the right angle for each piece as well. It's like building a bridge. When you build a bridge, you actually have to build almost like a scaffold um, of the bridge itself, and then you build the bridge and you take the scaffold away, right? So the, the jig that we did there is kind of uh, very similar as well. So this is when then basically you have the kind of the main components. Uh, you see that a weld line. Sometimes you go in and clean that a little bit as well. So if the weld is too kind of uh, swollen, you kind of start to make sure it kind of disappears as well. But this is what the pieces look like, basically, when they're, when they're uh, finished and before they go into the painting process. Um, again, it's important to work with people that know what they're doing. Um, the guys in Denver, they are very much aware of the kind of exposure to sunlight, not just in Denver, but also here. Um, there's a lot of sunshine, as you know, um, a lot of UV exposure, so we had to use a paint. Uh, and a primer and uh, a, a seal that basically makes sure that whatever we produce, whatever we paint, can hold up to the sun. So you have to do a bit of research and find the right paint and the specs and so on. Um, but it's an important part to do because you don't want to put something up there and then within a year or two years, it totally fades away, so all the colors disappear and so on. So we picked the kind of um, a paint and a primer um, and the sealant that hopefully will last for a very, very long time. And the colors will start to fade at some point, but not until like 10, 15 plus years from now. So that's the kind of um, the thought of this as well. So this is the process when it gets powder coated. Um, you hang every single piece and then it basically gets um, <coughs> And then you see here slightly different colors um, and so on. And then of course, if you have over 300 plus pieces, you need also space to place them. Um, so part of the logistics is to understand really what you need in order to kind of create a large volume uh, of material, how much space do you need. Um, so you see here things get a bit tight at some point, so you need to make sure that you use almost every single um, um, space in, in, the, in the shop that you have to make. Another picture. I kind of like this picture sometimes mm -hmm. because for me some they're like, um, are as interesting as the art itself uh, because I never anticipated to, them, to hang them like this ever but now that I see them hanging this way it's also kind of interesting what it creates and it turns it's a kind of effect um, and so on. Okay, so once they're uh, cut, cleaned, um, folded, um, welded, painted, uh, actually cleaned again, then painted um, we kind of ready and uh, we can start packaging them up um, and again it was in Denver so the guys actually drove everything down here which I think is like an eight nine hour drive or something um, again you need to get the right tools and the right equipment to, to drive things also again it's art so you need to be very careful of how you package them what kind of packaging you use uh, because the last thing you want to do is show up there and then the, the art is not in the shape that you actually left um, the, the shop Um, okay, then we arrive. I guess nobody was here, uh, well, not many of you were here on campus when this was installed because it was installed in August when I think there was the, the break. 
some people were here that had a chance to see it. Um, and if you know the building, there's different kind of um, textures to the surface. So uh, you have the, the regular brick, and then you have this kind of like um, brick that has a bit of texture to it. And of course, it's not flat. And what we needed was flat surfaces. So whenever there was a bit of texture, we actually had to make sure that we get rid of that texture by just sanding it off um, with, with certain tools. At the same time, you know, we had two boom lifts. Um, and we have to understand where they can go on the side because you know there's a bit of a steep hill there. Uh, you have to make sure that the boom lift that you that you order or rent can go high enough, uh, can actually navigate to the areas that you want to go to. Because again, we're kind of going around the corner as well. Um, and at, at the same time, we need to understand where things go in space. So in the computer, everything looks perfect, but once you go to the site, you actually have to find exactly where each piece goes. Um, so we found, uh, we, we took basically the corner at the top as the zero, zero, zero point. And from there on, we started to kind of place templates. And you see there, is, there's one of the templates um, next to the moon lift on the left, this white piece of paper. It's pretty much like plotter paper that has the layout on it and shows us exactly where we have to put every piece or where we have to drill the holes for each piece. So here you see um, you know, the guys on the boom lift starting to kind of identify the location for each piece. And don't forget, there's over 300 different pieces, so we have to be, we have to be very, um, we, have to, we have to make sure everything is exactly at the position where it's supposed to be. And this is here, the texture I talked about um, earlier. So this is actually like, you know, it's a nice finish, but it's not flush with the surface. And we need a surface that's flush. So, um, we had to start grinding. So you see here some of the white uh, spots actually where we had to grind the surface. Um, and we had to drill holes, and there was lots of holes to be drilled as well. Um, if you do this kind of work, you have to also be careful that you don't mess with the building uh, too much, because um, you know each building uh, is designed to kind of make sure that water doesn't go in there, there's no leaks, and so on. So. Uh, we had to come up with a detail that A, doesn't penetrate the entire surface of the wall, and also it seals the, the hole that began. So we introduced an epoxy uh, that A, helps us to seal the hole, but also helps us to keep the anchor inside that hole as well, and stabil stabilizes it uh, as well. But you can imagine there was lots of holes uh, that had to be drilled. <coughs> and this is the process of just grinding that extra surface that we don't need. Um, so it's flush with the rest of the bricks as well. And you see some of the marks on the wall, um, you know, just with like, uh, just uh, crayons basically, to wash it off easily. Uh, and then it's high up there. I mean, you know, you can't be scared of heights, right? So if you want to do this kind of work, be prepared that there's challenges. Uh, and I've, I've actually installed some other pieces in very tall, like, atriums. Uh, and it can be it can be quite you know like dizzy up there. So if you want to do this kind of work, just be aware that uh, it needs a bit of um, let's say dedication to do as well. But um, these guys did a great job. They actually were um, it's, it was a fantastic team. Um, they enjoyed actually they called it surfing with the with the with the boom lift. So they were basically surfing for one week up and down the facades uh, with the lifts, and they actually had a very good time. Meanwhile, um, this is happening. We, you know, all the pieces arrive on site. Um, as you can see, they're all packaged properly, so to protect them. Um, again, you have to find a way to label them. You see, like numbers and uh, names on it here with some blue tape. Uh, again, you need space, right? So thank God there was a lot of space out there, a large law that we can utilize. Um, so then, this, all of this happens, and it, this actually takes more time than you can think. To package these and to unpackage them is a lot of time, right? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of waste, but it takes definitely a lot of time to do that. Also, um, these are the bolts, the bolt heads that we used. Um, each of them have the exact same color as the plate that they go on to. And you see here some of the epoxy uh, blue as well. Um, and this was the most exciting moment, basically, putting the first pixel or fin onto the wall that you see there on the top. And 
once that's once that's you, you, you pass a threshold, it's easy. Because that's the most difficult one to put the first one on there. Once you make it happen, it almost it's 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 very simple. Well, to a degree, it's simple. Mm -hmm. um, so you see here the first one up there, and then the second and third one even small as well. And then it just starts to grow, you know, it's like um, a field that slowly starts to kind of appear in space. Um, at some point I thought even when I was getting the pictures, I was like, wow, you know, could we just stop for a minute and just look at it as, it, as is, you know, don't, don't continue. Because it already started looking interesting to me at least. Because uh, I've never seen it like this, I've always seen it as a full piece. I've never seen it one like with like 10 pieces by itself. And that's kind of interesting that to, to have that kind of uh, possibility to look at a process like this because there might be a piece now that I designed that might look like this, right? Very kind of simple yet very powerful uh, with just 10 or 12 pieces by itself. Um, and then it starts to wrap around the corner, which for me it's, it's personally quite an interesting moment because you know we talked about it again yesterday, it's kind of we start to make the corner disappear. So something that isn't the corner anymore is just something other. Um, and again, the guys that did, did the installation, they're um, very tech savvy, so they have a drone. Um, so they, they enjoy filming themselves when they install, and they also <laughs> utilize it, of course, right? So these guys are professionals that like to get hired by artists to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So if they can show other people, other artists, that they're very good at what they do, that they also like document the entire process, that's helpful, right? Uh, so they have a drone, they were starting to fly around this thing uh, and take pictures and videos and I'll show you some as well at the end. But I very much like this one because um, the art is not just on the wall right now, but it's also on the ground. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of, it creates this totally different pattern. Because um, mm -hmm. you would never put them like this in, in any order, ever. But this just happened because they had to you know, find a way to kind of put them into kind of, um, kind of families of Another of the drone shots, and this is your beautiful campus, the landscape, and then the art piece. And again, it starts growing. And actually, in August, we had totally different light than now. Um, so the shadows were different than whatever you will see today or tomorrow or the next day. Um, so very harsh shadows because the sun is very high up. Uh, and here it gives you also an idea about scale, right? So once you put a person next to the pieces, you really start to understand how big they are. If you look at the piece now, it might have a certain scale, but it really is understandable in scale when you put actually a person, a scale figure next to it, as in these pictures. Um, yeah, and then with, I think within a week or so, it was completed. Um, and it was all up there. Um, and then we started taking pictures of it from different angles. Uh, also, we used the boom lift to kind of still, since we still had it for a day or so, we started to take pictures from the boom lift. So, not just from the ground, but also from uh, different kind of heights. Um, and these are just some of the uh, pictures of the piece. And there are things that are happening that I did not anticipate, to be honest. Like, there's uh, a play that happens with like these pieces going back and forth in space, which I could never anticipate because you can't simulate that in a computer. It just doesn't work. These are effects that happen basically once it's on there, and then you realize they're actually happening. Same with the shadows. You can't necessarily like you know, or calculate all the shadows and so on. Uh, or for instance, yesterday when I went there during the afternoon, the com the reflection of the blue pieces and the white pieces and the yellow created green, right? So some like some of the pieces look green, which I didn't expect. I expect seven colors, none of them is green. However. <laughs> that appeared green at some point within the center mm. of the piece. So there's, there's moments that are happening um, that are a surprise, that might just happen once a year or twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually interesting to think about now what would happen once the snow hits it, you know, what is going to happen mm -hmm. with the background, um, where the snow is maybe covering the mountains, also when there's maybe small kind of um, small, you know, snow pieces on top of each fin. Mm -hmm. um, so these are moments that you can't necessarily like calculate. There's, there's no algorithm that can do that for you. So again, some of the shots here as well. And the 
again, this is a piece um, that that maybe shows what I'm talking about in terms of this kind of magic trick that it does in a way. Mm -hmm. it, kind of, it does things to your eye that you can't comprehend for a minute. It takes a bit of time to understand what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Or what is in the front and what's in the back and what's next to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and th this is the shot that I was talking about. This is actually the, the, the curve mm -hmm. uh, that we try to achieve on one side. Mm -hmm. And again, there's one on the other side. And then we got one shot um, when the sun was standing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that basically kind of concludes how the piece was conceived, um, developed, fabricated, installed, and so on. Um, and we can talk about if there's any questions, we can, we can do that. I also want to show you a few other things that we've done. Um, and I've only been doing public art for like five, six years, so it's kind of, kind of new to this in a way. But thank God we had already a few interesting commissions. This is around the corner in Denver, no. uh, at, at UC Denver. They just built a new building called the New Academic Building, and they have this gallery called the Spear Gallery, which is parallel to Spear Boulevard, right across the street from downtown. Um, so this is a piece that partly is suspended from the ceiling, so you see some of the buildings, and partly attached to the wall. Um, it's made out of aluminum, not as thick as the one I showed you, um, it, or the piece that's here. It's very thin, it's actually um, 0 0.042, which is almost like paper thin. The reason for the thinness is a few things. It's a weight, it doesn't weigh very much, and also you can actually start to shape the aluminum quite easily, so you can make this um, these kind of very complex curves, you can make this very complex uh, or, or kind of three dimensional kind of uh, curvature. Uh, another piece, and for some reason I tend to do a lot of pieces at school, this is at Georgia Tech. Um, again, in one of their newer buildings, this is kind of suspended in space. Um, it's called Jetson, it kind of reminds me a bit of a spaceship as well. Uh, again, made out of stripes of aluminum. And again, this is all uh, through computation. We're able to kind of take any shape and with these kind of way of subdividing um, the shape into mesh into stripes, we can actually build these very complex curves. So if you look closely, you see here the shapes or the stripes of aluminum that it's made of. Uh, another one, this is at the University of Oregon in Eugene at their math department. Um, and again, it's part of that family of very kind of organic shapes. Um, this is a piece that is 12 feet by 6 feet by 15 feet as a volume. So it's very tall. It's very, you know, like, it's massive. Um, but because we use aluminum and we use like lots of these holes, uh, which we had to do because we, the, 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 the client said you can't hang more than 120 pounds from the ceiling, mm -hmm. which is not much. I mean, it's like not much. Mm -hmm. So we had to do something that's very lightweight. So we started, you know, design this piece. We knew it was light, and then we had to like cut holes into it to kind of take material out. So this piece is 80 pounds, right? So it's again 12 by 6 by 15 feet, but it's only that light, which is quite. Mm -hmm. uh, Quite interesting. But again, it's aluminum stain. Think about like Coke cans, right? They're very light. So. Um, another piece this is at um, Salt Lake Community College. Um, this is more in the family of the one that's here, the reflection piece. It's these um, aluminum um, shapes that are folded. This one doesn't have any welds, so it's just a fold. Um, and there's, there's similar things happening with this piece. Um, which, which was explained earlier by Chad as well, in a way which I think was quite interesting. It's this kind of almost kinetic piece. So it doesn't move, but you move around it. So each side of every single panel is painted white on one side and has a color on the other side. So when you start walking around it, it will totally change. It's almost like doing, looking at a book that you flip open. Right? So when you walk around this thing, the colors will totally change right in front of you. <coughs> Uh, another one that's also very similar in the family is um, in Cedar Rapids. 
Um, again, this, it doesn't look very tall right now, but each of these fins is actually, it's actually like almost like eight feet high. They're especially ones at the top. They're almost like, I think, six feet or something tall. So they're very long pieces and actually standing quite like a man on the, on the wall. Uh, another one, this is a memorial piece. This is actually the only one I've done out of stainless steel, simply because the client wanted it to be out of stainless steel and have this kind of aesthetic of stainless steel. Uh, because it's a memorial, um, the, the coloration of the building had this kind of light gray tone in as well, so it kind of complemented uh, as well. Um, and this is a piece that starts from flat and starts to slowly grow, and the ones at the top are the tallest one um, that, it, that it produces. Um, and then just a couple of weeks ago, we, did, um, we won another project, again at Salt Lake, College, so same school, different building. Um, for interior piece, this is inside one of, again, one of the new buildings that we're using. It's similar to the one in Denver, which is partly attached to the wall, and the rest is kind of cantilevered um, from the ceiling, or kind of attached to the ceiling. So it creates this very kind of organic, kind of confusing shape. Um, it's almost like a labyrinth. When you look at it from certain angles, um, but again, it's something that's get, because we're going to use aluminum, same similar techniques that we've already done a few times, so we learned so we did a lot of research on it, we learned from it. So now we're able to do it again and also produce these other kind of shapes. Um, another piece, again, a couple of weeks ago, we got the commission. This is in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. It's a pedestrian bridge. And um, I was invited with two other artists to make a proposal for a pedestrian bridge that looks like an art piece. So we took this opportunity to do something very sculptural. Um, so what happens is you can actually like walk through here on this side of the art. On the other side, there's a bench on this side here. There's a bench here as well. Um, and the entire piece is made of timber, um, cross-laminated. Um, Timber called CLT. It's a very hard timber material called EPA, which you find on any kind of like outdoor decking usually. Um, so we basically just stack them next to each other. So they're all flat panels cut with this profile, um, and they're all next to each other. And inside is four or five cables going from one side to the other side, and basically holding them in place. And that way you can achieve this very kind of um, organic shape, soft shape, um, and so on. So again, so it starts, the cables start here, there's a, there's a concrete foundation, the cables run through this, and then start here again, they basically hold every single piece in shape. So it's, it's not like a typical bridge where you have one beam, it goes from one to another side, and then we plan it. This is actually made out of hundreds of individual pieces that are just, the only way it works is because they're kind of compressed into each other. And again, it's something that I can't come up with myself. There's a team of engineers that's <coughs> to me with these projects. Um, so there's a lot of brainstorming, a lot of feedback, a lot of ideas that are being produced, and then we kind of come up with the one that we think works the best. Um, so the reasons I think we got this project for the other artists was A, it was timber, and also B, it was doing a very innovative way of producing a bridge, which has actually never been done before. Are the individual pieces sandwiched together, or is it just the cables? Uh, yeah, so basically each, um, component has a thickness, right, almost like this, and that's promulgated cross-laminated timber, so it's timber this way, this way, and then, <coughs> um, and then there's a little gasket in between, um, and they're basically just like stacked. Right. So the gasket is there to kind of make sure that each piece, piece, uh, piece touches, but there's also air coming through, so you can actually ventilate the, the wood, because you don't want the wood to be not be able to be ventilated, otherwise it would start rotting. Um, and then another one which I'm super happy about is a playground. It's <laughs> um, a Fort Lauderdale Airport. Again, a building that will is being built right now and reinstalling this um, in uh, the summer next year. And um, what I explained to, to the jury when they started to interview the artist is that I wanted something because it's an airport. I wanted a place where people, where kids can play in the clouds. Because every time you look out of a window and you fly, and you happen to have an amazing kind of like landscape of clouds, at least me, I feel like 
diving in there. Right? <laughs> and of course, it's impossible, but it's like so soft and so nice, you just want to like jump in there. So I kind of wanted to do that for the kids, right? So I created these kind of um, cloud-like shapes. Each of them, you know, have different kind of openings and cuts, and you can crawl in them and step in them, and you know, do certain things on them. And then everything else in the space is blue, right? So you, you kind of have the white clouds and the blue sky. Um, and um, so these are the images that um, I produced for the competition. Once you hit reality, once you say, okay, great, we love it, then you actually have to like, make it happen. And right now, for instance, <laughs> uh, the floor, which I thought could be just this amazing uh, vinyl floor, now we have to use a rubber floor. Uh, so now that we have to find a rubber floor that has similar aesthetics, so it's slightly reflective. That took a bit of time, but we managed to make it happen. Um, for instance, um, the pieces themselves, they have to be specified, or, or actually there has to be someone from the National Parks and Recreation Department mm -hmm. that looks at every single piece and says, okay, this can be, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. This doesn't work, this doesn't work. So we had to actually go back and change some of the you know, openings or where kids can get their fingers stuck and stuff like this. So there are certain rules and regulations that this actually has to go through. Um, but I'm quite happy, and I don't have the new renderings yet, but I'm quite happy that we actually managed to achieve a very similar aesthetic um, to this one. And, um, and yeah, if you ever go to follow the airport next year, please <laughs> go play. <laughs> um, okay, so final project, and again, happening very fast, actually it's happening right as we speak. Um, this is a pavilion in Denver, uh, in Stapleton. Stapleton is right between the airport and Denver downtown. It's a new kind of development of lots of housing. But they also managed to get a lot of parks in that neighborhood. So this is actually inside the park, and um, they wanted something where people can go, rest, hang out, enjoy the landscape, and have shade. So a pavilion was kind of the, the, the right answer. Other artists proposed sculptures and stuff like this, but I thought a pavilion was something that would work best. Um, it's three domes. Um, it's also made of aluminum. And again, um, working with engineers and getting feedback from other professionals, we managed to create a, a structure which is a monocoque structure. So instead of doing a, an arc out of metal and then clad it with aluminum, we actually have no arc, it's just aluminum. So this thing is basically like a, a, a surface structure that holds itself up. And we do that by doing a layer on the inside and a layer on the outside, right? And through that thickness and through the curvature of the piece, it holds itself up. So you don't need beams. Like here, for instance, we don't need a substructure. Like this thing will basically, like an airplane, hold itself up. So that's a mock-up we had to build to understand if it actually works. Uh, because you know, building in a computer, running it through structural calculation software is one thing, but making mock-ups and actually understanding, and this thing is big, it's like it's tall. Um, was important for us to really understand that it works. And again, it's made of hundreds and hundreds of pieces. So the whole logistic I described earlier about understanding which piece goes where is important. Um, so on the outside you have color, and on the inside um, you have like white stripes. And then what you see here, these ones are basically the edges that kind of like frame uh, the openings, right? So they're not structuring anything, they're just framing uh, the opening, so it's very easy to recognize what's there. What you see on the ground is um, a little concrete bar that we had to introduce, it's basically like to make sure that people don't hit their head when they walk through it. So it's an ADA regulation. Um, but we redesigned the slide so now you can, you can actually sit on it as well. So what, what was it just a piece that we had to do, we now we managed to actually make a bench out of it as well. I don't have that image here, but no, that would be the final. Um, yeah, that concludes the talk. I was told it's like 30, 40 minutes or so, so I don't know. The time, but that concludes the talk. Again, thanks for the opportunity. This is the picture I took yesterday on campus. Um, and um, when I initially proposed the project, the, the art piece was on the other side of the building. So when you come to the concert hall, you would see it. But when I was here last year, um, and we, we did a walk on the, on the campus with Richard and Kathy, um, Richard said, no, it has to face the students. The students have to see it. Um, they, they are the ones that, that are with the audience. 
And we said, of course. Right? So again, it was easy to do because it was all in computer. So all I had to do was press one button, say mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and that was done. Of course, I didn't tell Richard. But it was an easy thing. But it, it, that's only possible because um, you, know, you have this opportunity right now with the, with the technology and so on. So I can only encourage you guys to really take advantage of it. I think you guys are in a great position right now um, to learn these things and to really understand them and to use them to your advantage. Um, because you can do a lot of things faster, more efficient, uh, and uh, have much more flexibility. Right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so any questions? Um, so you said you've been doing this for about five years. Um, what were you doing for that? Okay, so. Um, <laughs> Good question. I was trained as an architect, um, and I worked for, however, uh, when I was in Germany, I was trained as an architect, and I went to London to get a master's degree in design. So I knew I kind of wanted to build things and design things. Um, and then for about 12 years, I worked for architecture firms, design firms, doing concepts. So I was working on competitions, um, you know, Either it was furniture, or it was installations, or sometimes a tower, a master plan, a museum, these things. Um, and at some point I said, okay, I think I have expanded my time and work with other people. I think it's time to kind of do my own thing. Um, so that's when I started basically like applying for like, you know, these kind of projects that you can apply for. Like if you want to apply for a public art project, mm -hmm. you can do that. Like you submit your CV, your portfolio, these things. And if you don't have a portfolio, you team up with someone else. You team up with a friend who maybe has a project or wears another piece, and you take advantage of your, of your network. Um, there's an architect called Norman Foster that I used to work for, who was in England. And his firm is about, I don't know, a thousand people. You know, he's one of the most famous architects in the world. He started the same as anyone else, by himself. When he had his first clients, and they came to his office, which was a small space, so he decided to rent another office to pretend that he's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> he then was asked, okay, how, how, and then, you know, there was a few people sitting there, his wife, and, you know, <laughs> so he was asked, okay, like, how big is your staff? And he didn't say, I have four people, he said, I have access to 500 people. And that means he has access to his consultants, his engineers, his structural engineers, mechanical engineers, and so on. So he didn't say, this is who I am, he said, this is who I can be, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then sometimes that's how you get started. Mm -hmm. right. um, but yeah, I went through training with many, many people, many, many offices, um, you know, to get there. Right. Any other? Um, so this one was me and two other people, um, not full time. I mean, at some point, you know, it's just one person or just you know less hours. Um, and we started this last summer, pretty much when the competition was announced. We had about I don't know six weeks or so, maybe seven weeks to do this. Um, I've actually seen the other projects afterwards, not before course, because it's confidential. Um, but I, I've seen the other designs, and there's some, there were some very interesting designs as well. What I can say though, I think what we did was, um, we tried to capture the spirit here. So we did an animation, for instance, and I don't know if that helped or not at the end of the day, but we did an animation of um, this, this, this kind of environment. So we used a software called Lumion, which is actually used to design computer games. But it's so easy to handle, like, again, anybody can do it. Like, you know, you sit down for like a couple of hours and you understand it, and then you get better and better and better, right? So we use a software called Lumion, where you can do like um, landscapes, grass, clouds moving, right? So we did animation that kind of tried to mimic this landscape and try very much like how it would really look like. So to do that, I think maybe helped us um, to convince certain people um, to say, yes, this is something we can imagine. And then let's let's talk, right? When I see sometimes when I go to presentations with other artists, they just show up with a napkin sketch, or they show up with you know a sketch and say this is it. 
when there are so many opportunities to kind of show your ideas, visualize your ideas, you know, do a model, do a 3D print, uh, do a mock-up, do a kind of a detail, animation, drawings, diagrams, whatever you can do, and really go all out, because if you have a chance to convince somebody, that's, that's one way to do it, by showing them that you really have the kind of um, interest um, and knowledge to produce these kind of pieces at the end. About the design process that you use for the people that you work with in the design. That work with me, yeah. basically. Um, yeah, for instance, like that's where it's important to have a team, right? So I can certain I can do certain things with the computer, um, but I can't do everything. So for instance, David, who I mentioned, um, he's 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 uh, he can. Uh, he is very good in coding, for instance, right? He has absolutely no sensibility for design. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, when he shows up in the office, you're like, yes, are, are, are those really the shoes that you want to wear today? <laughs> <laughs> um, but he has certain skills. I mean, the guy is very smart, right? So when you, when you find these people that can complement what you cannot do, or what you can do and they can't do, and when you start working together, that's, that's a great benefit. Um, so sometimes these things are important. If you surround yourself with people, they don't work for you, that work with you. Right? And um, they're not easy to find sometimes. Um, it takes time to find them. Um, it takes you know, maybe one or two projects because before you really understand how things work. Um, but I've, as I said earlier, you know, I've worked in many offices, I've run big projects, um, I've run many teams simultaneously. Um, I've worked with projects where there's 50 consultants. Mm -hmm. So you have a, I don't know, $25 million building that you're designing, and then you have 50 consultants, and you have to coordinate all of them at the same time. Um, so you start learning really how to do that. And you start learning really what everyone can offer and how you can really take advantage of, of that collaboration. It's not easy, for sure. I mean, it's not something that, that you just pick up. It's something that has to happen slowly and over time uh, and through experience. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>